what you what I'll get you to do is turn to First Samuel. First Samuel chapter 14. I'll just get you to turn there. I'm not gonna be reading from there immediately, but at least you're open there. So first Samuel chapter 14. Now, this mini sermon is lesson number four on soul winning for beginners. Okay, so for those that were here in the hall watching those videos, videos one, two, and three, this is video number four. Okay, so it's going to feel a little bit incomplete to those that haven't seen the other videos. But what I want to cover today is The Silent Partner. That's the title for my sermon this afternoon, The Silent Partner. So once you've locked in the ser- sorry, once you've locked in the verses, once you know how to present the gospel with those verses that you saw in those videos, the next thing to do um, is be a silent partner. The next thing to do is to get out there with, an, with a fellow laborer and pay attention and learn. Just be silent. You know, there's not much more you need to do, but just be there, just be a help, and just be silent. Now, what was great about the soul winning today is that how many speakers were there? Myself, Jason, Callum, Rob, and Matthew. Five speakers. Now, let's say only those five were going out knocking doors and we went two by two. Well, you could form one group of two and you could form a second group of three or you could, you know, do two groups of two and one by themselves. Well, you were by yourself a little bit today. Anyway, uh, but with silent partners, with our children, they're present, we were able to form five teams, weren't we? We were, we were able to double the amount of doors that were knocked, we were able to double the amount of gospel being preached just by having a silent partner on board. Okay? And our kids don't know how to present the gospel. They haven't got the confidence. But how much more effective were we with a silent partner? How many more doors were knocked? And so once you've got your verses and you're ready to preach the gospel, get out there. You know, don't worry about practicing role playing in front of a mirror. Okay? Because you're not going to get the experience unless you're out there and hearing the conversations being had. Now, one of the big mistakes that I made in my life, and I don't want you making the same mistake, okay? Now, I gave you some very basic verses, right, to present the gospel on those videos. You're ready to preach the gospel now. Okay, if you memorize those verses, remember the references, where to go from start to finish, you're ready to preach the gospel. My big mistake, before, that took me a long time to get out there preaching the gospel, is thinking, boy, I'm going to face atheists, and I'm going to have to explain creationism and debunk atheist arguments. I'm going to face Muslims. And I'm going to have to understand why they believe what they believe. I'm going to have to face Catholics. I'm going to have to face, you know, all types of of people. And I'm going to have to give an answer for everything they give. And so I spent my time trying to prepare, listening to videos, listening to arguments. All that time wasted, years wasted when I should have just been knocking doors and getting my experience out there in the field. What I learned was, with all the stuff that I learned, almost none of it really came into play. (laughs) Like, I really didn't need it. All I needed to do was present the gospel and, and, and just uh, learn how to make sure we stay on track, okay? When someone tries to get me off track, how to get them back on track of the gospel. And I had to do that. The second lady that got saved this afternoon, she, got, she was going off track a little bit. I had to get her back on track. I thought I, I, was, I was losing her for a while, but she got it. She got saved. Praise God, right? And I didn't have to go and, and argue about her former... Um, well, actually, the first lady that got saved was a, was a former uh, Jehovah Witness and was a former Mormon. I didn't have to worry about what Mormons believed or what Jehovah's Witnesses believed. I just had to give her the gospel and she heard it. She believed. Praise God for that. So you need to be a silent partner. There's only so much preparation that you can do on your own. You'll gain experience just going out there and listening to what people have to say. Okay. And I'm not saying my way of giving the gospel is the most perfect way, but it's going to get you started. Okay. And as you gain experience, you're going to use other verses. You might even drop some of the verses that I gave you and use other things other analogies, other examples, other ways that make you feel comfortable to present the gospel, okay? But you'll develop that over time. Now, why do we go out two by two? Why is it so important? So let me just give you one reason why we go out two by two. First of all, Jesus set the example, and I'll just read these to you. Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve. So who were the twelve? The twelve disciples, the twelve apostles. Right? He got his 12 apostles, he called unto him the 12, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Two and two. Hey, and we have power over unclean spirits. We go with the word of God, we go with the power of the Holy Ghost on our side, and we are able with the word of God to deflect the devil and his unclean spirits, presenting the gospel with truth and sincerity. 
Okay? But it wasn't just the 12 disciples that he sent out two and two. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, did you know Jesus had another 70 apostles with him? Now, you probably don't even know their names, but he had another 70 that he appointed in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Uh, sorry, yeah, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. Right? Now, we were out, how many of us? There was five groups. We had nine soul winners, right, at one time at one time we were almost made the 12 like the 12 that went out two, two and two i want to get to the point where we have 70 70 people going out that would be 35 teams wow. okay can we do that can we grow from the 12 to the 70 i think we can i think in due time we can right? i'm not saying tomorrow but we continue doing the lord's work he will add to our church and we'll be able to grow and keep knocking doors in this area uh, so I didn't even finish what I was reading. But after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So before Jesus would come, he would send his disciples. He would send those 70 before he got there. Hey, we're doing the same thing. Jesus is sending us there. We're introducing them to Jesus. And then we're saying, hey, receive him. Receive Jesus Christ the same way these people were presenting the gospel at that point. But another reason why to go in, in pairs is, the, is great is because in, Ecclesi in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Two are better than one. Two are better than one. You know, and you might say, Yeah, but you know, you were out with Sebastian, your six year old. He can't do anything. Me and Sebastian were better than if I was just by myself. Right. Two were better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Pay attention to that, kids. Their labor. Sometimes when I go with my kids and we see someone save, saved, I say to my kids, you got them saved. They're like, no, dad, it was you. No, we were a team. It says here, because they have a good reward for their labor. We're laboring together. Okay, silent partners with the experience. Guys, you know, that's the next step. Become a silent partner. Help us to grow. And you are going to enter into the labors of the preacher, you're going to be rewarded with the preacher. What's a better reason to go soul winning than getting those eternal rewards? Trust me, when you're in heaven, you're going to want to wish you had more rewards than what you get. Okay. Now, let me give you some other just practical reasons why having a silent partner is great and why it helps. Well, the Bible just said there that your labor and reward is greater. So it's greater than what one person can do. But secondly, they are there to assist you. A silent partner is there to help you. Okay, now in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 10, so the next verse after that one that said two are better than one, it says, For if they fall, so if, if one of you fall, the other will lift up his fellow. So he's a fellow helper. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Now just think about that practically. Let's say I'm out there soul winning by myself. I, I don't know, I hurt myself, I trip over, I get hit by a car, whatever. I don't have any helpers there. I'm going to be worse off than having someone there that knows me and that can provide aid, right? Just from a practical point, okay? We go out, hey, we can get hurt. We're going out there knocking doors. You know, we're crossing the street. Who knows in what way, you know, we can get hurt. But hey, if we have a helper with us, they can be there to assist us if anything goes wrong. They are there to assist. Another reason why a silent partner is great is for protection from false accusations, protection from false accusations i never enter into a house if i see a single mum or a single lady and you know sometimes people will invite you into your house but i will never do that i always just stay at the door okay but if you've got a silent partner hey you know they can't accuse you of anything right they can't say oh this happened or you know if, if there's a if there's a if there's a fight if there's an argument and they can claim well this happened well no the partner there you've got two witnesses saying the truth and you can protect yourself from false accusations because instead of being his word versus one word versus one word it's one versus two words so there's protection in that sense protection from false accusation another great reason to have a silent partner is because the silent partner can be praying for you and that's what you should be doing as a silent partner if the preacher's giving the gospel to someone at the door hey be praying for them be praying intercede for them ask the lord to reveal these things to the person that's hearing the gospel and ask the Lord to give the preacher wisdom and courage and boldness to continue convincing that person of their need for a saviour. So you have someone there praying with you at all times, continuously praying for you. 
Get that, hey, if you're a silent partner and you haven't been praying for the other person, get that into your, into your, 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 your cycle, into your system, okay? That's something that's very, very important. Another great reason for a silent partner is for the silent partner to give you feedback. And even if you're brand new at this as a silent partner, you can give an experienced preacher good feedback. Because you know why? When you're preaching the gospel, you're so focused on trying to get this message out, sometimes you don't see the big picture. And the silent partner can see what's going on. The silent partner can see how that person's reacting. And they can give great feedback. You know, don't get offended if someone that's less mature than you, someone that's less experienced than you, gives you feedback. Hey, and the experienced person should be giving feedback as well to that one that is less experienced. Please ask for feedback. You know, don't get annoyed if someone's just there trying to help you and say, hey, look, I noticed this happened. I think you could have done better if you'd done it this way. I appreciate the feedback that I've heard people tell me about my preaching. Um, and again, it doubles the efforts. Doubles the efforts, okay? Twice as much soul winning. Twice as many people going out, knocking the doors. Silent partner is an important part of the soul winning ministry, okay? You're not nobody. You're important. And guess what? It's not just doubling the efforts. It's quadrupling the efforts. Because when you're ready to preach the gospel, then you can go out and you can get a silent partner. And that silent partner will be now training and learning how to preach the gospel. So while you're doubling the efforts, you're also getting prepared to quadruple those efforts. All right, now you guys are in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. I wanted to take an Old Testament story and apply this to the silent part. Now, I know it's not a perfect analogy, okay? But I think there is a lot that we can learn from this story in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6 and apply it to you being a silent partner. Okay, let's look at this. Verse number 6. And Jonathan said... To the young man that bare his armor. Do you guys know who Jonathan is? That was the son of King Saul, one of David's best friends, a great uh, soldier. He was a captain, a great man of war. Okay? Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor. So we have Jonathan who's experienced, and we have then a young man, someone who's inexperienced, right? Who's helping him. He bears his armor. Back in those days, you know, a soldier, someone that was experienced to fight, would not carry all their weapons by themselves. Because if they took it with them by themselves and they got to the war, they got to the fight, they'd be tired. They'd been carrying their armor the whole way. They'd been carrying the weapons the whole way. So they had an armor bearer to help them carry the weight. And that's what you should be doing as a silent partner. Hey, you know, when I take my kids, I get my kids to carry the tracks. I get my kids to carry the Bibles. I get my kids to carry the water. You're laboring together, okay? Get them, hey, you're the armor bearer, kids. <laughs> you know, if you're the silent partner or anyone else that's, that's trying to learn, be the armor bearer. Help the other person. Carry what you can. I remember one of the first times I took Matthew soul winning, uh, and Matthew had a backpack. And I, I didn't have much. What, what did I have? A Bible and a few tracks. And Matthew had drink. He had water. He had all this stuff. And he goes, oh, I got ready for Callum because Callum's never prepared. That, <laughs> that's so true. You know, he was the armor bearer. He was ready to get into the fight. And now he's preaching the gospel on his own. Praise God for that. So uh, where am I reading from? Verse 6. Oh, look what, look what Jonathan said to the armor bearer. Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. So Jonathan's his experience one. hey, let's go to the Philistines garrison and let's go fight for us. And if the Lord's for us, we're going to win, whether we're many or we're few. And you are few, you're two. <laughs> okay, there's two of you, but you can go into the fight and save souls from hell. All right. Now, you might be thinking as a silent partner, yeah, but I'm not really helping. I'm telling you, no, you're a huge help, first of all. You're a huge help. Okay, but if you think you're not even helping, look at verse number seven. First Samuel 14, verse seven. Seven. And his armor bearer said unto him, So what did the silent partner, if you will, say to Jonathan? Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. And that's what you ought to be as a silent partner. You're going to say to the preacher, Hey, I'm with you. You want to go knock doors? I'm going to be there with you. Okay? What you want to do, hey, I'm ready to go and get into this fight with you. And we need the encouragement of the silent partners. It's so much harder to go soul winning just by yourself. But when you've got someone with you, man, you can encourage one another, right? Jonathan's like, let's go. The silent partner, the armor bearer is like, yeah, let's do it. 
And you know, when you got those two, yeah, the two are better than one, okay? You're going to get out there, you're going to be more encouraged, you're going to be more motivated to go knock doors and preach the gospel. Verse number 13. Drop down to verse number 13. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him. So they go to the garrison, they get up, they're going to get ready to fight and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. So Jonathan's the experienced fighter, right? He's the experienced soldier. He gets up and starts killing these, these Philistines or at least injuring them. He knocks them down. What does the armor bearer do? The armor bearer is not leading the fight. But notice when, when uh, Jonathan knocks down his, his, his enemies, it says, and his armor bearer slew after him. So think about this. And you'll see soon, well, let's have a look, where is it? It's in verse 14, that they killed 20 men. Just two of them. Two of them killed 20 men of the Philistines. Okay? Now this is what was happening. Jonathan was going as the experienced fighter. He was fighting, knocking down the, the Philistines. And then instead of finishing them off, because he's going to get distracted, he's focusing on the next fight, the next man that's coming uh, to fight him. And he's going to fight that person. But you know, in those days, they didn't have guns and stuff like that. Someone could be injured, but they could still get up and fight. So the armor bearer, when he'd see someone that's injured, he would slay them. He would take care of business so they wouldn't be able to get back up and fight against Jonathan. Jonathan was focused on taking on the next enemy. Hey, and that's what your job is as a silent partner as well is to help the preacher not be distracted, to help the preacher be focused on getting the job done. We're not killing anybody. <laughs> We're not going into warfare in that sense and shedding blood. Okay? But we are presenting the blood of Christ so they would be saved, okay? that they would be saved from hell. This is a spiritual fight. If you're saved, whether you like it or not, you've been enlisted into the Lord's army. You've been enlisted to fight the good fight for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13. And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. I already read that. Sorry. Verse 14. Verse 14. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made. I just want you to notice those words because these are the words of the Holy Ghost. These are the words of God. Does God look at this fight and say, Jonathan did a great job. Is it Jonathan that's getting all the glory? Is it Jonathan that's getting the mention? No. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made. No doubt Jonathan had the greater fight. No doubt he was leading the fight and the armor bearer was just slaying people that were already injured. Okay. But God says that it's a slaughter and he recognizes that it was Jonathan and his armor bearer. Okay. You're the silent partner. God looks down and sees, yes, the preacher and the silent partner got these people saved. They did the work together. Um, made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow. So the silent partner is numbered with the leader. You will receive rewards for the work you did together. It is a team effort. And again, I'm talking to my kids here. It's a team effort. I need you out there. And if you guys say to me, my kids, I'm talking to my kids right now. If you say to me, Dad, let's go soul winning, I'll take you soul winning. Right? You'll motivate me. You'll encourage me to go out there. And I want to take you because I want, to see, I want to see you guys to grow up and one day be a greater soul winner than any of us here in this church. I want you to be greater than, than us. I want your generation to be greater than our generation. So Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9. Actually, before I read that, I'll, I'll finish off with that one. But we're talking about distractions, right? We're talking about the armor bearer taking down the enemy so they wouldn't get back up and distract Jonathan in the fight. That's your job as the silent partner, okay? Now, I can think of one example. Matthew, you might remember this. When we were, was it Beerwa that we were sewing together? You were, Matthew was preaching the gospel to an old man and the old man had a flat tire. I was the silent partner. What did I do? What did I do? I was changing the tire. Right? I was changing the old man's tire so he could just pay attention to the gospel being preached by Matthew. Okay? That's what you do. You get rid of the distractions. Right? A dog starts barking. Hey, ha you know, make the dog happy. You know, distract. You know, when we were at uh, Rob, you might remember also when we went to that town in Cherbourg, you were talking to one of the ladies. You gave her a full gospel and there was a little, she had a little kid. So what did I do as a silent partner? I just went to play with a little kid. 
because he was making a lot of noise. He was distracting mum. I went, no, mum needs to focus. Mum needs to concentrate. Rob needs to be able to focus to give the gospel. I'm going to go and play with the little kid, <laughs> right? Hey, that's your job as a silent partner. Get rid of the distractions. Slay the ones that are already taken down, right? <laughs> Get rid of those distractions so the preacher can focus on the work. Um, I mean, there's so many. I'll give you one, another example. I remember in the church in Punchbowl where one of the guys, he was, I was a silent partner. He was preaching the gospel to a lady at the door and he was halfway through the gospel. She seemed really keen to hear the gospel. Then her husband came out the door and said, what's going on? And instead of the, you know, allowing that him to come out and distract in the conversation, I went to the husband and started talking to him. Oh, we're from a local church, blah, blah, blah. And I started to give him the gospel. At the end of it, she got saved and he got saved. Right? But if I let him distract the conversation, it's possible that neither of them could have been saved. Your role as a silent partner is huge. It's important. But first of all, of course, I'm not expecting you to give the gospel straight away. Just get out there, double the efforts, double the work just by being quiet and learn and grow. And I, I promise you this, at some point, you're going to be sick of being a silent partner and you're just going to be like, let me take the next door. <laughs> let, me, let me try it. You know, I promise you, you're going to get to that point where you'll be like, let me just do it. I'll do it. And at that point, you're pretty much ready to go. I do want to say just one little thing as well. As a silent partner, please don't... Remember, the armor bearer took care of the, the fallen, so the, you know, uh, Jonathan wouldn't be distracted by the fight. Don't distract the preacher. Uh, there's been times where I've, I've taken someone with me who's meant to be the silent partner, and I'm giving the gospel, and they're interrupting me. You know, they're putting their... Th they, they think they've got a great thought, and it might be a great thought, but then they think, ah, oh, maybe I'll tell, maybe I'll say my great thought. But it distracts me. I don't know where you're going with that. Like, I've got a plan. I've got, a, I've got something that I want to do. But the silent partner wants to talk over me. It, it's distracting. Don't be that way. It's called the silent partner because you're silent. And let me tell you this. Even though I'm experienced, and if I have someone that's less experienced with me, but I, I let them to do the talking, I'll be silent. I'll be, even if I think I could do a better job than that. No, I'm going to refrain and I'll be silent. There's been times where I've had someone less experienced they're trying to give the gospel and then they turn to me like, help, you know, with their eyes, you know, help. I don't know what to do. I don't interrupt. I'm like, nah, you've got to go through it. You've got to experience it. You've got to do it. You've got to learn. I mean, if you, if, if you take over, they're not going to learn, right? I'll only, I'll only help if it's like a disaster. <laughs> like, like if you just start preaching heresy or something, like, then I'll step in. But if you're just struggling with, no, you got to, look, you've got to learn, okay? A fight's not easy. Being a soldier is not easy. It's hard work. It's something we all need to do. So the silent partner, again, I'll just finish with Ecclesiastes 4.9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Their labor. Their labor. You want to start earning treasures in heaven? Those that are inexperienced, that don't know how to preach the gospel, you want to start getting treasures in heaven? There's no greater treasures in heaven than souls that are saved from hell. You want to start doing that? Just be a silent partner. Just come, just come along and be quiet. Okay, let's pray.